Cool. Uh, yesterday, during really exciting uh, talk about the Swift Java interoperability by Ben Cohen, uh, he said that full system rewrites rarely succeed. Yet we tried. <laughs> I am uh, Wojciech Rilko, uh, a software engineer at Culture Code, and today I'm excited to share our story of adapting Swift for our backend services. I will begin by describing our legacy, our legacy system, then I will walk you through our new Swift-based architecture, and finally, I will comment on how we are operating it and uh, developing it. First of all, let me introduce our company. We are Culture Code, a dedicated team of 11 people working remotely here at our nice Stuttgart office, and we make things on our winning personal task manager. Things has enjoyed great success with a strong track record. Its first beta went public in 2007, and it was among first 500 apps on iPhone App Store. We've won Apple Design Award twice, and today we have apps for all platforms from Apple ecosystem, including newly released Apple Vision Pro. But it's not just our user interface what shines. Users equally appreciate our background Sync service, Things Cloud, which we launched in 2012 and has been greatly trusted by our users for its reliability. So what exactly does Things Cloud do? Its main purpose is to sync data seamlessly across multiple devices. And the most important aspect of this thing is resilience. It doesn't matter uh, if a user has flimsy internet connection or if they work on multiple devices while being offline, for example, on some long-haul flight. Once devices get back online, the sync will catch up and data converges to the same state so that the user enjoys the consistent data across all their devices. Uh, such behavior is not easy to achieve. Uh, we had to develop our uh, own rigorous framework inspired by theory of operational transformation and, and Git version control system. There are also other accompanying services to Things Cloud like handling push notifications and mail to things feature, which allows users to send an email to specialized email address and it will appear in their things inbox as a regular task. And the backend architecture of things cloud is the main focus of this talk. So originally our system was built using Python 2, C, with some Java seasoning. It was running on top of Google App Engine, which is fully managed platform for cl cloud apps. And for our database, we used fully managed NoSQL service data store. And we encountered issues with performance, maintainability, and the platform is itself. Uh, speaking of performance, uh, Python being interpreted language is inherently slower and Python 2 lacks the support for extensive concurrent processing. Uh, and also it was quite memory hungry when it came to larger JSON files. Uh, so Google App Engine had to spin more than 50 instances to keep up with user traffic. And together with the latency of data store database, our regular request response times were more than 100 milliseconds. Uh, maintainability also posed challenge uh, because to efficiently process push notifications, we had to develop custom C service based on lib event. And as you can imagine, that was pretty prone to error, error prone to, uh, uh, to modify. And finally, various deprecations 
force us to decide on our future direction. Should we switch to Java, Go, or C++? What would pair best with client-side Swift? We think server-side Swift. You may say, oh man, that was a bad pun. Like, <laughs> it's not surprising and it's quite solid choice. But back at the time, we felt different. We felt that it's risky. And we perceived Swift on server as not mature enough. But it offered unique selling points. It's compiled language with expressive static type system. It has automatic reference counting instead of less predictable garbage collection. And it integrates easily with C, and today even with C++, and Java is already in the queue. So we decided to take the gamble. Like, there was a real chance that if everything turns out well, we could benefit from all those advantages. And turned out well it did. It took me and my colleague more than three years to rebuild our cloud. We've been using, using it internally for past almost two years, and it's been live in production for 10 months. So let's go through our architecture. So our Swift code base has around 30,000 lines of code, and we built that on GitHub Actions. Final binary has around 60 megabytes, and clean build takes more than 10 minutes. Is that a lot? I don't know. But it takes longer than this talk. <laughs> uh, but we don't build just the binary and distribute it. We built Docker image. And with the final image size being around 130 megabytes, it's based on Slim, Swift Slim. And where do we run it? Uh, obviously, uh, Kubernetes and, of course, managed one. Uh, the new home of our platform is Amazon Web Services, AWS. And to interact with AWS services, we use Soto library. Uh, to keep uh, everything in order, we use Terraform as our infrastructure as code solution. This allows us to run multiple copies or tiers of our platform, which is super useful for development and testing. And our configuration is almost 11,000 lines of Terraform code. That sounds a lot. Uh, to run six systems successfully, you have to know what's happening inside. Uh, so we generate logs using our custom JSON logger in Swift. And we ship them using FluentBit into the CloudWatch. Uh, CloudWatch is AWS solution where we can store our logs, where we can uh, watch them, and it also generates incidents. Incidents go to the third-party service, PagerDuty, and that wakes up a responsible person. Uh, we also ship uh, Prometheus metrics, and we are using Swift Prometheus Swift package for that. Uh, and our foundational Swift framework is Vapor, the great and awesome. And we hope new version is coming soon, better than ever. Vapor uses Swift Neo underneath, and even though we don't interact with Swift Neo directly, I think this is like honorable mention of that because it's prove, proven rock solid. So now let's zoom a little bit. <sighs> Which database to use is a complex decision. And we knew that we want relational database with proper translational support and strong guarantees about durability of data. And we came to conclusion that 
AWS Aurora MySQL fits us best. Um, in Swift, we use Vapor's MySQL kit to connect to database. And Aurora worked very nicely so far, but it struggled with uh, database updates and schema migration with larger tables. And I mean, like I'm talking terabyte here. Uh, so we had to uh, design some framework how to offload our data from the database to S3 while not losing transactional guarantees. And there is need to store more ephemeral data like push notifications or cached data. And Redis is obvious choice here. Uh, we use Redis Stack Swift package for that uh, to connect to Redis. And although it's pretty basic, it uh, works well. So far, I haven't touched on client traffic. So it's roughly 500 requests per second in peak hours. And it comes through HA proxy, and which forwards it to particular service. And when it arrives to our Swift service, it's up to Vapor to route it to our code. And then there is mail to things service where arriving emails are processed using Lambda, AWS Lambda, and results are passed using simple queuing service to our Swift code. And you may wonder why there is Lambda here? Well, uh, you see, we need to process incoming emails from the internet. Internet is a wild place. We need to parse them and we need to produce nice plain text representation of them. Uh, this required a major libraries and guess which language has that? Yeah, so we, we used Python again for this task, which is quite isolated. We put it into Lambda and we are passing the result to our Swift service. Uh, finally, we talk to APNS and we are using APNS, APN Swift package for that. And if you remember, I told you that previously we need to run custom C11 based service to process all the notifications. Now the Swift and Redis do the trick. So this was basic overview of our new architecture where Swift plays central role. And now I will zoom a little bit more and comment on development and operations. Here you can see part of our Kubernetes cluster, which runs on four instances, each with two virtual CPUs. And every instance is running multiple Swift services. Uh, you can see here that there are are multiple Swift services with different names. So we are, we are having just one source code. We are building one binary, but we have pretty flexible configuration. So the binary can run as different services. This approach means that we share all the code. We share the Docker image and build, uh, but we enjoy benefits of running multiple different services, like fine-tuned permissions or different alarm conditions. Uh, because our team, our backend team, consists only of two people, me and my colleague Maxime, who is also here and eager to chat with you later, uh, we have to ensure our infrastructure and Swift services are as robust as possible. So to search for potential errors, to test our alarming system, to stress test auto healing capabilities, we do chaos testing. So we run chaos agent and it every day, every day it does some nasty thing to our platform. Like it unwraps nil in our main things cloud service, or it restarts our main database. And this is how we learn about potential problems 
on our platform before they occur on production. We are running this on internal production where only selected users uh, are. So finally, we develop mostly using Xcode. And because we uh, prefer to develop against real stuff, we develop small testing framework where you, we are using port forwarding so we can connect to database and Redis, which are otherwise on the private network of the uh, Kubernetes cluster. And also doing tests, we read the configuration and environment variables from particular pod in Kubernetes, which ensures that we are running with exactly the same set of permissions and exactly the same configuration as real program will run. So, full rewrites rarely succeed. Ours did. And we are super happy how all it turned out. So please take this as supporting evidence for the case of server-side Swift. So uh, server-side Swift works great for us. We haven't noticed any uh, issues, no memory leaks except for one year ago in Swift Neo. So it's like one memory leak in two years. And ecosystem has all the bases covered, at least for us. We found all the packages we need and they work well. And uh, yeah, new things cloud has been rock solid for two years internally and 10 months in production. Thank you.